Hi, everyone. This is a really important episode, and so I just want to start out by saying thank you for listening. We had some sound issues because I had to record it from an Airbnb, and I did not have a good microphone. So I do apologize, but I do hope that you'll listen to the whole thing because it's so good. Thanks for listening. Hello, friends and nonprofit leaders. Laura Zelke here. I'm your host of the Your Nonprofit Life podcast, and today's episode is a gift. In honor of the Thanksgiving holiday that we're having here in the United States, I wanted to interview someone whose people lived here well before the country was quote unquote discovered. Someone whose people have creation traditions based on this continent. Someone who works day in and day out to preserve her own culture despite colonization. The White Mountain Apache tribe lives in the central southeast corner of Arizona on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation. And today, my guest is not only a member of the White Mountain Apache tribe, she also grew up on the reservation and now serves as the executive director of the Fort Apache Heritage Foundation. Her name is Krista Beasley, and in this interview, Krista shares her story about how she went from being a wolf biologist, how cool is that, a wolf biologist, and an ecotourism guide for the tribe, to being an executive director with a small staff. Um, She's overseeing the restoration of like 20 some odd buildings and wearing a number of different hats at the foundation. In addition to hearing about Krista's journey into nonprofit leadership and the work her organization is doing to preserve the White Mountain Apache culture, you're also going to learn a little bit more about American history. When we talk about the boys and girls dorms, and hear about traditional foods served at a White Mountain Thanksgiving, including things like egg corn stew and tennis racket bread. I can't wait for you to meet Krista Beasley, the Executive Director of the Fort Apache Heritage Foundation in Arizona. Hey, have you ever wished you could hear some good news for a change? Well, I might have just what you've been hoping for. Welcome to Your Nonprofit Life, where we remove our rose-colored glasses and explore what leaders are actually doing to move their nonprofits from messy to thriving without burning out in the process. I'm Laura Zelke, Director of Member Experience for the Nonprofit Leadership Lab. Join me each week to explore the ups, downs, and whoopsie-daisies of your nonprofit life. Let's get started. Well, hello, Krista. It's so exciting to see you. And thank you so much for coming on to the podcast with me this week. Well, thank you, Laura. This is an honor. I was very shocked when I saw your email inviting me to do this podcast. I've seen and heard podcasts, you know, in the past. And now this is my very first one. And like I said, I'm very honored. Thank you. Well, I'm honored that you said yes. I gave a little brief introduction at the beginning. And to me, it was important to make sure that as we're going into the Thanksgiving holiday, you know, I want to talk to you. You're Native American, Apache. I want to hear about what you're doing at your tribe. And I know Thanksgiving isn't the same for everybody. And so I was just wondering, do you even celebrate Thanksgiving? Yes, Laura, we do. Mostly everyone does their traditional meal. And same here. And this time of year, some of the tribal members actually uh, go hunting. So neither deer, elk, turkey and so whatever they tag out on they normally feast on during thanksgiving as well so Uh like you said is different and for my family unfortunately my mom is the main cook and she does not like game food so we do the traditional ham turkey but i think one thanksgiving we actually did a mexican meal and then some other times we had italian just to mix things up because then christmas is just around the corner you know and so we have the same thing again so we just mix things up and then occasionally we'll throw in our own traditional food that we've known for the past several years that's been handed down, you know, from our. Business. So, what is that? Acorn stew. To me, my husband passed away and it was kind of like an acquired taste. All the non natives, the first time trying it, it's so bitter. So, like I said, uh-huh. it's inspiring. So, you've got acorn, you've got the meat, it's a stew, and you put the acorn grinds in it. And you normally serve it with traditional bread, could be fry bread could be tortillas or ash bread or tennis racket bread. So those are a few traditional breads. I've never heard of tennis racket bread. What is that? So tennis racket bread. So of course the name, the tennis racket, it's all made of like wire. Uh You make your traditional dough 
you have an open fire and you wait for the coals, you put that rack, warm it up, you put your bread on that so the bread's not completely in the fire. So you have the fire and the coals and then you have the rack and the bread baking on top. So you mm -hmm. wait for one side and then you flip it, just a nice round. It's pretty similar to pita, pita bread. Oh, okay. Now, okay. Kind of thick and round. Yeah, or like a torta. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's that sounds really kind of interesting. To yes. Yeah. So acorn stew, that's one I haven't heard of. And mm -hmm. I could see it being an acquired taste. For me, you know, we moved from California to North Carolina. And my whole family trees from Michigan, I mean, for a couple generations. And so we had certain traditions. And one of the things that we have is like a sweet potato casserole, but it's very sweet. Like you put crushed pineapple on the bottom and then you have like this sweet potato mixture in the middle and marshmallows on top. And out here, they do it very different or like stuffing. For us, we stuff the turkey, but out here, they do it like in a casserole dish and it's flat and you cut it into squares like cornbread. So it's very, you know, just every area has their own traditions. And um, I was just curious, you know, being on a reservation, if it's something that's celebrated or, you know, is it like a harvest feast? You know, is it actual Thanksgiving? And, you know, I just have been learning so much about colonization and just mm -hmm. everything that's gone on in our country and trying to be a lot more respectful of other traditions, you know? Nice. I know the one major ceremony we celebrate through the summer is a sunrise dance ceremony. It's where the young lady becomes a woman and you practically prepare for this in advance with the girl running. And it's like almost four days of dancing. You oh, wow. have the breaks to eat, to sleep. And then early next morning, you're dancing into the night, you know. So two years ago, my daughter, she had her ceremony. And so that's the one, I would say, the, the major ceremony that the tribe celebrates still to this day. It's a little sad because the males don't have a ceremony when their voice change, kind of still changing. They used to, but that tradition is, is somewhat lost. But one medicine man did a little sweat lodge for my oldest when his voice changed. So he kind of hung out with the guys, you know, the guys gave him all the prep talk of, you know, being a man and being respectful. And so those are some of the two traditions that I know of that we still celebrate, you know, and of course there is the healing one and the healing one is more private because it's just with the family and the medicine man. Like if someone is sick, they do a special one for that. And that's not really just spoken of because that one's private. So those are kind of still the ones we still celebrate to this day. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. One of the goals that I have for this podcast is that it's educational, you know, that we're learning something about different cultures and different traditions and different missions and organizations. So thank you so much for sharing that. So at the very beginning of the podcast, I introduced you just a brief little bit, but I would love it if you could tell us kind of what your organization does, where you're located, just a, just like a brief little intro. Okay. Well, thank you, Laura. This November, I'll be in my fourth year being the CEO for the Fort Apache Heritage Foundation. We're located, I would say, central east of Arizona, not too far from the Mexican border. And we're about 1.6 million acre. I would say we are very fortunate as White Mountain Apache tribe to have this prestigious land. Very beautiful. A lot of recreational lakes. We've got our hunting that we're known for. We had some famous celebrities come out and hunt in our area. So those are one of the key things we have, you know, like I said, the lakes, the fishing, recreational, hiking, our own ski resort, um, and of course our tourism, and we do have a small casino. But Fort Apache Heritage Foundation, I would say, is a place where cultural heritage preservation and perpetuation that occurs on the tribe in ways that this nonprofit does Stuff such as, you know, providing financial technical assistance to restore and revitalize this area. Even though this Fort Apache Heritage Foundation, the place Fort Apache, you know, it's still bittersweet to the tribe because based on history, you know, some horrible things have happened. You know, back in the past, some of those natives were tested and we were just uh, tested on these new vaccines. And now we're still seeing some long term effects. And, you know, the place is, like I said, still bittersweet, but 
In these past few years, in 1997, a huge lawsuit occurred between Bureau of Indian Affairs and the White Mountain Apache Tribe. We've got the settlement fund we want at the Supreme Court. So two years after that, uh, this nonprofit occurred. So this nonprofit has been around for several years. And I'm just glad to say, being a White Mountain Apache tribe and a member of the tribe, that I am their first CEO in the past. You know, they had some non-natives, you know, run it as executive director. And some folks stood up and say, we need our own kind to run this place and, you know, incorporate the community and bring back our culture and heritage because we're losing, you know, our language. So that's pretty much a good nutshell of talking about Fort Apache. Yeah. You know, I think the first time that I learned really, and I don't think it woke me up. I would say I'm in the process of waking up right now to white supremacy and just the systemic, all of that. But I've been aware of the loss of language as a problem for many, many years. When I first got married and I started my business in Fallon, Nevada, there's actually a Paiute Shoshone tribe and reservation there in Fallon. And I remember (laughs) I was doing anything for anybody. So I was like designing newspaper ads and, you know, I made little buttons and they came in and had me make some buttons for them for their language because they were working really hard to make sure that they didn't lose it because it was like the younger generations weren't speaking it and the elders were starting to pass. And it was like, if they didn't actually take, you know, preemptive action, then they would lose it. Is that part of what your Heritage Foundation is doing is trying to preserve the language as well? Yes. We have a subgroup called Community Outreach and Programming. So it's part of board members. And we are trying to uh, get grant money to, you know, do activities. Before the COVID, we did some storytelling. So to the Native, we only tell stories in the winter. So this starting right now, you know, at this time last year, we had a couple of events at the museum and we had a really good turnout. For breaks in between, we serve our traditional hot tea and our traditional trail mix, which is walnuts. And we try to, you know, keep it traditional when we do these little events. Unfortunately, with this COVID thing, we were probably not going to be able to do it again until things, you know, settle down and get back to our normal lives. I love that. And Did you say you put onions in your trail mix? We have some onions and it's a bit kind of bittersweet. It just depends on what time they're picked. So we have some onions and some walnuts and some squawberry that are dried. And we also make a drink out of the squawberry bush that we make. uh, It's called Apache Kool-Aid is what we call it. Apache Kool-Aid and it's a squawberry. I'm going to have to put some links to this stuff because you're telling me um, about food I've never heard of before. And I just love that. So I'll do a little Googling and add some links to what a squawberry is. And I love that. And so I have a question for you. You're actually on a reservation, right? Your organization is on the Fort Apache reservation. Did you grow up there? Are you from Fort Apache or did you move there later? Yes, I was born and raised in the White Mountain Apache tribe. And I, as I mentioned earlier, it's also called the Fort Apache Indian Reservation. The Fort Apache Indian Reservation was actually the first name given to the tribe, I think, back in 1900s, early 1800s. And that was the name given to us by the Bureau of Indian Affairs when the fort came on. And then I think probably mid-90s or so, the name was changed back to White Mountain Apache. So we go by both. We still have Bureau of Indian Affairs on the reservation that helps us at times. But yes, born and raised there, I attended East Fort Lutheran Mission School through kindergarten, through high school. And then I went off the reservation for about five years, went to Northern Arizona University and got my biology degree. And my goal then, because the tribe paid for my scholarship, and of course, with help from my parents, I thought, you know, the tribe did so much so much for me, I would like to come back and help the tribe in any aspect of, you know, providing me this education. And so I was lucky I was able to, you know, it was perfect timing because being the wolf biologist, the the wolf, they just started to reintroduce and they were coming onto the White Mountain Apache land. So it was just perfect timing that I was hired and I did the wolf thing for about 10 years. And within that 10 years, I got my master's in operations management and ran a wolf ecotourism program. And what I did there is for about a week and during the summer, uh, people such as you We'll come out and we'll do a tour. We'll go do some wolf tracking. We'll go look at scats. We'll do some howling at night. 
put up trail cameras and show them how to use this telemetry stuff of how we locate wolves with their GPS collars. And then we also incorporate culture. So every night we have a social dance. You know, people come and dance and if they don't want to dance, they'll listen to the traditional song. And I was very fortunate because my dad was, like I said, as a medicine man and he came out and done that and, you know, did the songs for us. And then my mom also being traditional and a great cook and knowing all the traditional meals. I had her one night help the tourists got their hands dirty and made bread and made a traditional meal and having them taste the acorn stew, you know. And then we have a different night of crown dancers. And that's one of our, our dancers that we use. You probably heard of the Hopi and the Kachina dancers. Uh-huh. And well, with the White Mountain Apache tribe, we have crown dancers and we have them come one night to perform. And then another night, we'll have flint napping. You know, we'll have a gentleman come out and show how to make bows and arrows. And then there's just one night of just rest. And then we'll end with a horseback riding and sunrise. So we make a kind of a a loop south all the way east on the reservation and back at the casino for their last night. So, I mean, I did this for three years and I really had a blast and it was doing really well. And like I said, with my husband passing, it was hard trying to run that and trying to be a biologist and being a biologist, just the pay wasn't, you know, quite what I wanted. And having three kids, having this beautiful home was the main thing that, you know, I had to get another better job. And so luckily a position opened up off the reservation, but I still work in the tribe and I worked with First Things First for about five years. I would say this is a really good taste of nonprofit. Actually, our funds came from tobacco tax and there's different zonings. And so the tribe was separate. So I still worked on the tribe, but I work with parents and teachers from Head Start, daycare, and these funds were targeted to uh, zero to five years of age. Okay. And you said that was first things first. So that's kind of like Head Start, Head Start. and it's off reservation. It's off, but I still was the executive director for the White Mountain Apache Tribe, but I still worked with, like I said, the kids and yeah, we yeah. did funding for them for books or any uh, services or trainings to the teachers and the daycare facilities and stuff. So yeah. Uh-huh. And did you, and you don't have to answer this if it's, too personal, but like, was that something that you really enjoyed? Because I would think that going from what you just described of being out there in nature and tracking wolves and dancing around the fire and having your traditional foods and going from that into a environment with zero to five-year-old children, I don't know. (laughs) I don't think I could do that. (laughs) Yeah, I, it was a huge 180. It was a big sacrifice because, you know, the kids were young and this house dad built because I told the kids, you know, we might have to sell. It's our main uh, bill of the month. And like, no, mom, you can. So I'm like, okay, let's find another job. And luckily with my master's degree, I got hired being the executive director. And like I said, 180, being out in the field, hiking, driving, seeing the beautiful reservation. And the next thing I'm sitting at a desk. With my laptop, meetings left and right, um, yeah. going down the reservation, talking with parents and getting grant programs going for them, you know, giving money to buy books or whatever resources they yeah. need. And yeah, it was a huge change, but yeah, I had to do it. And it was a huge yeah. sacrifice and for my family. And I think I was telling my kids, you know, that year when my husband passing, I don't remember any of it. It was strange, Mm -hmm. you know, but I think that last year kicking into gear. So I'm like, okay, I got to snap out of it and I got to do this for my kids. And so, I mean, that just kept us afloat, you know, keeping them here at the house. And my mom, I'm so thankful she stayed with me for almost the whole, I would say about, she, my daughter's what, 14. So almost 10 years, she stayed with us here to drive the kids to school for me while I work. And you know, come home, meals were ready and the kids were fed or she'd take them to their soccer, basketball, softball, you know, games. So, I mean, it just all worked out well. It was, like I said, it was a huge sacrifice I had. Yeah, I would say so. I don't know what that's like. And my heart just goes out to you for that. I know it's one of those life altering, like life never goes back after that. Mm -hmm. And I could see how it would be a huge sacrifice, especially when you 
studied to do the biology and you are out there so connected and yet you're not at first things first anymore. So how did you go from that to being the executive director at the Fort Apache Heritage Foundation? Like how did that transition happen? Ah. One day I was at my office and out of blue, this lady, her name was Tracy. I still remember to the day, you know, she calls me. She says, are you Krista Beasley? I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, I'm a headhunter and your name came out. And we were wondering if you want to apply for the CEO position on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation. I was like, yeah, I know. I grew up there about five miles east and, you know, I drove my bike right by it. And I'm like, I'm not looking for a job, though. I said, I'm OK here. And she was, well, she was just come on, give it a shot. And I said, well, I don't have time to, you know, update my resume and do the application. I'm so busy and being a single parent, just don't worry about it. Just give me any recent updates from the last few years, any trainings. I will do all that for you. I'll update your resume. I'll even do your application for you. I'm like, okay. So the day of the interview, of course, I had to take leave from first things first and did my interview, which was by conference call. And Next week, I made the first round and I said, we want you to come in for, you know, in-person interview. And so I go down to Fort Apache and nice historic a Victorian house there and went to the upstairs and sat there. It was a little intimidating because the board members seemed like they outweighed the tribal members. And I was a little nervous. I think there was only two tribal members then. And then the other six were non-members. And of course, I did my homework prior to the interview. And some of them, you know, wrote books. I have a Harvard professor, board member. I have another professor that does archaeology in Canada. You know, another lady that works in Phoenix. And she used to work with a Janet Napolitano. Another one that was an attorney for Boeing. So I was like, oh, I was so... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Imagine sitting there with people like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel you. Nervous. And I'm like, okay. Then I have to turn my grounds and say, all right, this is my land. I just grew up here, not too far from here. I shouldn't be intimidated by these guys. It, they may have more experience and more education, but, you know, this is where I was born and raised. So don't be scared. Uh, you can do this was, was how I had to tell myself internally. And now I'm um, going on four years this November being the CEO at Fort Apache Heritage Foundation. So uh, uh, very thrilling. It, it, I mean, a good case of nonprofit. and. I think, I mean, all the nonprofit, I have huge respect, you know, of what they do, getting money and some of the impact that they have on community that I've seen. So that I've seen, you know, and attending meetings, I, I'm very thankful and I'm glad that um, I was able to join. And, you know, the funny thing, though, Laura, when my husband was still around and I was the wolf biologist, that was probably about five years. This position actually came up. It wasn't a CEO. It was just an executive director. And my husband was saying, you know what, you should try it. But unfortunately, the pay was a lot less than being the biologist. So I said, no, I don't think I want to take it. But it's funny because it came full circle again. And the position came up. And this time I applied and I'm working there. So I thought that was very odd and unique in a way, you know, when my husband was yeah. here and now he's not here. And I'm sometimes t when, you know, talking to myself as like, Chris, look, I'm here working at Fort Apache now, you know, this is what we wanted. Yeah. And my husband, then he was so into Apache culture. We used to make moccasins and I used to bead and, and that was kind of our thing that we would do with the kids. You know, at times we would make traditional outfits for the kids and enter them in tribal pageants for toddler girl of the year, toddler boy of the year. And, it was fun, you know, and I do miss it. Unfortunately, 10 years now, I have even touched the leather, you know, or even beaded, you know, so it still breaks my heart. But yeah, so that's funny. It just came full circle yeah. again. Yeah. And the kids get older, too. And they're not so much into that. But that's when the grandkids start coming around. And then you get back into all that stuff yeah. again. So and and hopefully with you and me, we have a few years to go before that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying especially to my son who's listening and editing this. No rush. No rush on the grandkids. <laughs> my son, during the COVID in May, he just got married too. And and I'm like, he asked me, I'm going to get married. And I'm like, I'll say yes. I mean, I have one strand of gray, but don't make me a grandma yet. I'm not ready is what I told him. I said, I'll give the approval, but I don't want to be a grandma yet is what I told him. That's it. Yeah. You know, time can take a turn. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's no rush on that. Mm -hmm. 
So Kristen, why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe a deeper dive into what you're doing at the Fort Apache Heritage Foundation? I know you mentioned earlier, well, in our earlier interview, you said historic preservation, restoration, revitalization, and perpetuation. Could you elaborate a little bit on some of that and, you know, kind of have a deeper dive into what exactly you all are doing there? When I first started, the foundation created a master plan in 2005. So those are some of the backbones that I'm trying to move forth and in moving forth. So we've got health and wellness, economic development, and cultural perpetuation preservation. So those are some of the the goals that I put in front of me to look. And it's a bit challenging, like I said, being a nonprofit, but the good part of us at Fort Apache, and I kind of refer to people as like, we are a unique nonprofit because I don't think without the funding through the lawsuit that we received in 1997, we don't have, we don't struggle for funds at this moment, like seeking money, like a nonprofit, normal nonprofit is what I would say is like, they have to go and out and find money on an annual basis, you know, to, to run the organization. So. Prior to me coming on, these buildings were fixed. We have 27 historic buildings, and out of those 27, 24 of those historic buildings we manage. One of our oldest buildings dates back into the 1800s, and that building is called General Crook. Wow. The tourist attraction where people come and see and look at the old cabin. But with those buildings, when we took BIA to the Supreme Court, they gave those buildings to the tribe in very poor condition. Walls were caving in, ceilings, you know, it was raining, you know, it was really bad. So that's why the tribe took BIA to the Supreme Court, won the 12 million. And with that 12 million in these, I would say in the past, I would say seven years, these buildings are now in really good shape. We tried our best to fabricate them and look at old photos to try to mimic how they look and try to bring that fort look back there on the historic site. And to this day now, Out of those 24 buildings, we have, I would say, one, two, three, about four of them that are not occupied, but the rest are. So our other source of revenue besides, and the 12 million, let me rephrase that, those 12 million is restricted funds. So they're only for rehabbing the buildings, wear and tear, maintenance, and they pay for our, my facilities guys, pay my facilities guys for, you know, doing all the maintenance work. So, So those are restricted funds. So our other source of revenue is renting to commercial and residential tenants. So we have both those on our property that are occupying the building. So we have uh, tribal communities come out and rent, and then we have a couple commercial buildings. The other three buildings is a Bureau of Indian Education. So we've got the Theodore Roosevelt scale school also on campus and they are running from school right now of course due to COVID you know they have their their social distancing but we have them on campus so we partner with them and the other unique thing is the museum the museum is on our campus weird thing is the museum belongs to the tribe even though we're nonprofit the tribe charters us but the museum is run by the tribe the tourist fee funds go to the tribe so we don't get those fundings But we run a tourist shop in the museum. So the shop revenue is also our other source of revenue that we have. So the shop and then, you know, doing the uh, commercial and residential renting of the buildings is what we do. And then one of our big projects coming up is the boys dorm. That's about 32,000 square footage. And it's three layers, three levels. And we're in a phase of getting an agreement going. So what we're thinking is the first floor do interpretations, and we have two elongated office space, and we're thinking doing meeting rooms. Second level, we're going to do office space, and then third level, do more apartments. So that's a big project that's coming up. Okay, so when you said a boy's dorm, I was going, well, why would you be building a boy's dorm? But what you're saying is there is a boy's dorm, and you're refurbishing it. So what was the boy's dorm for? That was when they had the boarding school. They, I think about 1902, I would say 1902 to 1920s was when they had the boarding schools around there. They had Native Americans that came out there and went to school there and cut their hair, you know, put real clothes on them and 
fortunately told them they couldn't speak their language. So those are some of the historic trauma that the tribe sees yeah. and that's how they see Fort Apache. And that's why I said at the beginning, it's a bittersweet place for some of the natives. And that time, though, we had a lot of Navajo natives come and then even some other natives that came and went to school at TR. So that was a boarding school at that time. So you can see there's a boys dorm and the girls dorm. So the girls dorm actually belongs to the school because now they use that to house some of the uh, students there that are off the reservation, too. So. Wow. So these buildings have been around And that's what you're saying is when they left and they left them in such poor condition that you're kind of having to go through and update everything and then you're able to use it. When I think about what you said for the main level and interpretation, are you going to be having like exhibits about what it was before? Like that this was the boys' dorm and this is what was going on here and that type of thing? or what? Yeah, that's on? kind of in the works right now. We're trying to get some funding to do more interpretations um, and try to get more tourists. So yes, for that level, I think we're trying to incorporate the Apache Scout. And then we also want to incorporate, you know, the school, uh, how, you know, from they have some, uh, some past and present photos. So you can see these natives with long hair and then you see another uh, present uh, picture where they're in school, where they're enclosed, their hair are cut. So some of those histories we want to show people. And of course, the language and some of the food. And so, yeah, that's our main goal. So hopefully we'll be able to yeah. do that and see what kind of funding we can get to do that. Well, I just think it's so important to tell the story because it's not a story that you learn when you're in school. It just isn't. And the more we can get this information out to the community and to the world, I hopefully it makes the world a better place. And I'm curious what it's like trying to raise money and trying to run an organization where it is so bittersweet. How's the local community that, let's say the non-tribe community, how do they respond to what you're doing out at Fort Apache Heritage Foundation? For the non-natives, you know, they like the history and they love the buildings. You know, like I said, we try to fabricate as how they look back then. And and I think just the history there, the general crook in the museum and our culture, a lot of non-native tourists, you know, they really want to learn. Before the COVID, we had different rounds of people come around because my office is also a building where you can come and look at some of the exhibits and they kind of roam back to my office upstairs. And so I'm curious, you know, I asked, you know, where you guys from? I have some people from Tucson, I have people from Canada and come out and I ask, how did you hear about us? And the funny thing is, oh yeah, the movie Fort Apache and some of the movies of, you know, the old Western, they kind of refer that to Fort Apache, but they, when they come here, I was like, no, that's not what the TV show is about Fort Apache. It's not the same, you know, but like I was saying, you know, you know, when people come to Fort Apache, it's different from what they see of the old movies of Fort Apache. But yeah, I mean, it's really great. But, you know, back to the natives, like I said, you know, that bittersweet, but we want to change that. You know, we want Fort Apache to be where people come, have a safe place. You know, a sad thing is that, Laura, our reservation, we don't have a park with playgrounds and people to walk. There's nothing. We have maybe a couple of basketball. They have to go to actually school. And sometimes schools are closed in the evenings for people and to take their kids. So community members said, we want a place where it's safe. We can walk. And we do have a track field in front of our campus that people can walk. And so a couple of times I'll see families with their kids, you know, walking around the track. And I told my board, you know, one of my goals is because we still have property on the north part of campus. And I said, you know, the heart of historic landmark is here. And based on us being historic and, you know, we can't build new stuff because of we're a historic landmark. And that's how we're noticing, you know, we can't build other stuff. So I said, to the north of us, there is a canyon. Why can't we build a nice walking bridge? Money, but get a playground, get some kiosks and get a big loop for people to walk. You know, we can have entrance on the one side, people to drive in, or they can have access with this bridge because we do have an Arrowhead Cafe. That's also a nonprofit run by Johns Hopkins. And we have people coming in, you know, they try to serve traditional food too at times there. So people come and eat. So I said, they have a place to eat. They got a place to play and they got a place to, you know, walk around because, you know, the reservation, we've got high rates of obesity, you know, diabetes, 
And I think just because we don't have a place to, you know, walk around or try to, you know, exercise is heartbreaking. So I told the board, we need to put this in our goals and in the future and see what we can do to help the community. And so that's one of my goals being here at Fort Apache is, you know, impacting the community so we can bring back our cultural food, you know, bringing back exercising, you know, and our language and culture. Yeah, I wish you the very best with that. It absolutely should be done. And I can imagine, too, a lot of if you attack your park project with also incorporating in some accessibility, that that might help get some funding, too, you know, with all these um, accessible, more accessible parks, that I think there's money there for that as well. And I'm wondering if you've had any challenges as far as like being the executive, the first executive director for the Heritage Foundation there. Um, have you had any challenges in your leadership that you feel like you've, you've kind of overcome since you've been there in the last four years? Oh, yeah. Like at the beginning, when I said, you know, getting a taste of being at First Things First, a little taste of nonprofit, you know, no, not knowing where you're or knowing where your funding comes. And then from an actual 100 percent nonprofit, you know, I think that first year when I got getting my feet wet was a bit challenging. And it's myself and, you know, four other staff members. So it's me, my business manager, my facilities manager and two helpers. So there's five of us managing a little over 300 acres of site with 24 historic buildings, you know, our HVAC systems. So here's my day sometimes, Laura. So one day I'm an HR. One day I'm a landlord with complaints. The other day I'm looking at a contract. And then another day I'm like, okay, we just found asbestos in one of the old buildings that I told you about, General Crook's building. So we got to deal with the company trying to remove lead-based paint and then now I've got to try to find tenants for the other buildings and then dealing with tourists. And then I got the museum shop. Okay, what are, how's our sales? <laughs> so, eh, those are, so those are my days sometimes. And sometimes all of them is on my plate and I try to hit all of them. I think that first year into the second year and part of the third, it was challenging. It was hard. I didn't know the style of the board. And of course, I told you about my board. It was intimidating. At times, I feel like I'm not doing my job to their expectation for hiring me. And I feel bad because I feel like, damn, I let them down. And and that's me. I'm a pleaser. You know, I avoid conflicts and stuff. And I try to even everything out, you know, all right, this is what we're going to do. But it was so hard because their expectation was way higher than the outcome of what I had you know, working at this place. And, you know, the good thing, though, is just this last year and prior to COVID of this year, 2020, coming into January and now almost to December. And I've heard history, you know, of of other CEO. It'll take you a couple of years until you get on your feet. And I feel like just this last year, I'm there. You know, I've worked some extra times, which I needed a little bit more time management. And I think that's my number one challenge was just me you know, getting the hang of what I need to do and how things are run. Because like I said, I wear a lot of hats and it's challenging. And now I feel, and I think just with this COVID, with the break, I mean, I worked from home, but my kids were here, just kind of refreshed me and let me, and I took two steps back through this year. It's like, right, this was how I'm going to do it. I took some time management class. I got me a coach. This coach is going to direct me how to do this and how, so, you know, how some of these other things worked. And now to me, it's all clicking. These pieces are coming together and I feel like, all right, bring it on guys. Let's go. So I'm really looking forward for my next board meeting. Uh, Since our board meeting in October, I got so much done, even though with this closure, you know, we've got evaluations for our irrigation, our sewer. We're going to try to go back. Unfortunately, this is the sad part. So in this settlement agreement, there's also a list of deficiency that that the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs is supposed to give us. So some of it is for irrigation, sewage, lighting, roads, fencing. So the BIA always gives us the excuse. So those aren't safety issues. So we cannot give you money for that right now. If there's a safety issue, we can probably give you money for lighting. So they give us money for lighting, but we end up changing into sewer and irrigation. And so we're getting our ducks in the huddle and we're going to go back to BIA and say, hey, in the agreement, these are some of the other things that 
you promise us that you'll do. So here are our evaluation. This is how much it's going to cost us. And so, so I would say in the next year and a half, we're going to go back and I'm hoping we don't have to go back into the, the court system, but, and that they'll say, okay, you're right. We'll give you the money. So that's one, one thing that we're preparing for. So like I said, it's a lot of work, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot confident than, than three years ago, I would say. So. Yeah, I can see it. I was going to say, you know, you're, while you were talking, I was just like, she's a rock star. (laughs) I mean, you are, because look at what you've done. And so when you look back over your career so far, you know, and you look at the experience that you had, and you got your feet wet with the nonprofit at the First Things First, but coming in as someone who grew up there to be the executive director and go in when, you know, you were listing the board. And that's kind of how I have felt a lot of times when I'm in like with mm-hmm. Joan Gary and Dan Oshiak and, you know, the people on like Lindsay and Noelani and, and I just kind of look around and go, oh yeah, it's intimidating. Mm-hmm. It really is. And then there does come that point though, where it finally starts clicking. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? And, and it, I, I'm just thrilled to see like, all right, let's bring it on, you know, cause 2021 has got to be better than 2020, <laughs> you know, and it's exciting. And it sounds like you have a strategic plan you're working out and also just some personal visioning for what you see happening um, at the, at the reservation and in your buildings. And it's exciting. And it just seems like, I think your husband would be so proud. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I know he has a smile on his face and he's like, wow, it came around and she's there. Like we wanted, we wanted at that time. So it just wasn't. And you're doing it. And so you're not only affecting the lives of your children, but you're affecting the lives of every member in that tribe and in your local community. And I just want to thank you so much for, you know, spending the time with me. To come on this podcast. I know you were nervous, but you were you were great. You were really great. And I learned so much and I just really appreciate everything that you're doing to make sure that we all understand and appreciate the history of all the work that you're doing at the White Mountain Apache tribe and and really just in our community. I know you've been involved in the book clubs and the lab and it's been so nice just getting to know you and being able to support you through COVID because it's, it's been a year. It's been a decade this year. That's what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so glad. I'm not sure how I ran into you guys' organization, the Nonprofit Leadership Lab. I think I just ran into it through Facebook. Yeah. And I'm like, this is something I like. And then I saw the book club and I'm like, I love to read. And, and um, I'm looking forward to the next session of book reading. And I mean, it just clicked. It just worked. Like I said this whole year was weird. It just all yeah. place, which is good. Yeah. I'm, I'm very well, excited. and I have to just give a shameless plug here because our next book club that we're starting in January is going to be Joan's new book. So she took her book, the Joan Gary's Guide to Nonprofit Leadership, mm-hmm. and revised it and added a couple chapters and rewrote a few of them and added in stories so that it's not just her journey. It's also other people's journey, mostly people who are members of the lab or her coaching clients. And she's actually going to be the one to lead the book club. Oh, so she's yeah. going to lead the book club on her own book. So we're really excited and nice. starting to make the plans for that and how to promote it. So it's a sneak peek. If anybody listens all the way to the end of this, then they'll hear that little <laughs> shameless promotion. Well, thank you so much. And what is the best way for people to get in touch with you and your organization? Unfortunately, right now we're getting our website revised, but we still have the old website and it's www.fortapachearizona.org and it's all spelled out. Okay. And then my email address, I mean, sure you can share it to Laura. Sure. kbeasley at fortapachearizona.org. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what it is with people and choosing long domain names, but we have that with the nonprofit leadership lab. So yeah, I get it. And I'll put links to that on the show notes page and also might have to get a recipe for this acorn stew because that sounds really interesting. Yeah. (laughs) 
You know, the hard part is getting the acorn though, because it, yeah. you go gather it, pick it, you got to deshell it, then you have to grind it. So it's a long it's a process. process, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And people buy them around here, buy a coffee can. And that's how we do it. My mom buys it and then we have an evening of acorn stew. So yeah. Well, for people who want to try it, I'll see if we can, you know, get a recipe or something. And uh, at least if nothing else, a picture of what it looks like. So Sure. You can get that you. too. Yes. So thank, thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. And I will see you in the village and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening. To access the show notes or share feedback on this podcast and link over to our socials, visit our website at yournonprofitlife.com. That's yournonprofitlife.com. And hey, if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you're going to love The Village. It's our exclusive online community where we take what we're learning in the Nonprofit Leadership Lab and apply it. We take it to the next level with live Q&As, boot camps, online book clubs, and legit support from experts committed to helping you extend your nonprofit life. By the way, since we're just getting started, it would mean the world to us if you'd subscribe to the podcast and leave a great review on iTunes. The reviews will help us get the podcast in front of more people as we try to take the whole sector from messy to thriving. See you next time.